Good afternoon, Carl. Greetings, Michael. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you today? I'm good. Yeah, things are fantastic. It's a beautiful, sunny fall day in Utah. It doesn't get much better than this. Amazing. Amazing. I'm noticing, though, like you just the, the background has changed again. Like the, the blue couch is gone, but I'm seeing is that Mr. Burns over your <laughs> shoulder here. <laughs> that is, well, the blue couch is right over there. Okay, um, just my, it's it's just on the other side of the room. Still, it's my still wife close. kicked okay. me out. My wife has taken over my office. She's an interior designer, and so she's kicked me out. She's making me work outside, which is a whole other story, but it's been fantastic. And I came in to record here. She rearranged the whole office, so this was the view. And yeah, this is the only shelf I get. This is like the rest of the office is tile and carpet samples, and I got this shelf. And okay. So Mr. Bur Mr. Burns has to live on this shelf right there. So why, why, why Mr. Burns? Like, are you a particular <laughs> Simpsons fan? No, actually I'm not. That was a gift from Justin Costelli actually, because, and it's a long story, which maybe I can tell you another time, but um, I'm really, really familiar with imposter syndrome. The imposter syndrome is a friend of mine. And as part of my way of coping with imposter syndrome, I personified it. And Mr. Burns is who I've turned it into. So I, I can tell you that story another time, but when Mr. Burns is around, it means cool things are about to happen. They may fail, but it means cool things are about to happen. Well, fantastic. So, yeah. I, so I like in the in the spirit of cool things happening that you have created. I, you know, actually for for the discussion today, uh, you was just looking through. We get a lot of comments in from people listening to the podcast of just asking, like, what do they want to hear the two of us talk about? And and I've been getting a number of questions lately, going all the way back to some stuff that we actually talked about. I'm probably the better part of a year ago, you had talked about this like statement of financial purpose that you create as part of, I think, how you keep clients on, on track when they're waking out in market volatility. So we were talking about it last year when markets got crazy volatile in the, in the pandemic. You said, you know, we've kind of come back to their statement of financial purpose and ground them there and then build a layer on top of that to get them comfortable. So we had some people come back to say, like Carl mentioned that statement of financial purpose thing, but we didn't really go into a lot of detail about literally like, what is a statement of financial purpose? That's kind of a, a, a weighty label. What exactly are we talking about here? Yeah, no, I mean, that would be, that'd be a really fun conversation. I, I, it's one of my favorite subjects. So maybe it'd be helpful just to give some like history, uh, you know, I, the well, I'll put it in context and then we can back up and go through it. Okay. Like a statement of financial purpose to me is the first, I think of it as the, like a third on a piece of paper, the first third of a one page financial plan. Like it's just, it's, it's literally just a sentence or two about why, right? Just a reminder about why. And we, we can go through examples and go through why, you know, why even do that in a minute. I'm getting a I'm getting a glimpse already of the difference between like my financial plans and your one page financial plan. Well, because we've known that for a long time. I just heard that correctly. The top third of your plan is a sentence. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it's a like, one page. It's like a, a one page that's plan. like a centimeter on mine. But okay, <laughs> yeah. please, please keep going. I like to put more stuff on that page than you do. But yeah, well, yeah, for sure. Maybe for we'll sure come back to that do. later. And there's, there's, there's. I mean, there's. But right, I, I feel like, like it's, it's in lights. Like it is, it is. This one sentence ensconced in beautiful white space at the top of a financial plan. So like, what, what is the sentence? Like, where is this yeah. going? What, what are we yeah. doing with this sentence? So I know we've talked a lot about one page financial plan. So just, this is just the first little part of a one page financial plan. So go back and review the one page, what else? Like there's that and then goals and then next actions is essentially what I think of as the executive summary slash one page plan. The statement of financial purpose to me, I have sort of a, 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 a dream or an opinion that I'm trying to kind of forcibly insert into the industry that every client will have a statement of financial purpose. And I'll, let me give you a little bit of the history. So, okay. um, and, and I get asked this, every, it's not every day, but a couple of times a week for sure on podcast interviews or, or media interviews, like what's the biggest mistake people make? And I still think it's this, I think it's, it's, all the other mistakes are because we have never gotten clear about why we're doing this in the first place. Like, okay. why are we spending the way we are? Why are we saving the way we are? Why is the investment portfolio invested the way it is? It all comes down to this idea, like what's the real, so this isn't a goal, right? So Bill okay. Backrack would have called this, Bill Backrack would have referred these to these as values, right? And I, I, 
I read Bill's book, you know, when I was first in the industry. So I was always thinking okay. values. And then I ran across the work of an academic and I, right now, I can't remember the name. I, I, I'll try and find it and get it to you for the show notes, but um, who talked about purpose and purpose being this relatively enduring thing that informs our other activities. And I was like, I remember where I was actually when I was listening to that podcast, it was with Scott, Scott, Scott Barry Kaufman's podcast. Um, okay. who, and Scott's a psychiatrist, psychologist, a, a positive psychologist, psychiatrist, psychologist okay. out of Wharton and or University of Pennsylvania. And I remember I was walking on a trail in New Zealand when I heard this and I was like, oh my gosh, purpose, right? So that's when I, moved away from this idea of values to, to purpose. I think they're probably pointing at the same thing and I'm not a uh, uh, whatever zealot about what you call it. Okay. I just like the idea of a statement of financial purpose, almost like a, um, an investment policy statement, right? Okay. Like if you're an institution, you have to have an investment policy statement, right? Yep. I think individual clients, we should have an invest a statement of financial purpose. So here's what it is. Like mine, my one page plan, that line says, Time with my family, mainly outside. Sometimes I get that reversed. Time outside, sometimes with my family. <laughs> I actually, time with my family, mainly outside, and service in my community and my church. That's what's there. Let me go through a couple more because I find like just riffing on them for a minute. Jerry and Vera's, like actual clients with no last name. Um, Jerry said to me, Carl, I just don't want to be a burden to the kids. And if there's money left, like, and I would like to see them enjoy some of, some of their inheritance while I was alive. Right. That's, that's, that's deeper than the goal, but you, what, what's interesting is goals to me, this is where the conversation starts because goals, we can now use this to frame the goals, right? We get to show them what their goals are instead of ask them, oh, what's your goals in an intake form? So like with Jerry, it's really easy now to say, oh, interesting, Jerry, what would that look like, right? So that's why I think it's, it's, it's nestled foundationally, it's, it's underneath the goal. So, um, you know, the one I wrote about in the book, the One Page Financial Plan book was the, the ER doctor who she said, I just want flexibility time or flexibility, freedom, time to think about having a family, right? That, that sort of sat underneath there. Um, another client who said, I never, she was older, retired. I never want to have to worry about money again, right? So it's those kind of statements. Now, nobody has to cry. Like it's not a requirement that you cry to have, but- I feel like the fact you pointed that out is makes it sort of an expectation though. Yeah, I used, to, I used to have a goal. I wouldn't tell clients this, but I had a goal in the first meeting that someone was going to cry and it wasn't going to be me. <laughs> but you don't, you know, like Jerry, Jerry and Vera, they were like from Tom, Tom Brokaw's greatest generation. Mm -hmm. You know, Jer, Jerry had never like, he didn't come, he came to me for the investments. What have you got for me, kid? Right. And we all know that if we, if we engage at that spot, at least if we, if we start competing at that spot, like my investments are better than their investments. And especially if we compete based on inches, right? Like, look, my, my pitch book is three inches and theirs is only two. Like if we engage at that level, we know what that leads to. It's just a, an absolute, you know, sort of gerbil wheel of a relationship. But if I can say to Jerry, Jerry, got it. Performance is super important to you. Mm -hmm. And it's frankly, it's important to us too. It's one of the key drivers of lifetime success for sure. Before we get there, can we just back up? So help me understand why this would be important to you. Jerry, why, right? And then ask him. And then Jerry says to me, gosh, I don't know, but I just never want to be a burden to my kids. So now, like, Jerry didn't cry, but he'd never said that to anyone else. And now to see it written on the top of the page that he sees every time we meet, as a reminder of like everything else we're doing is in service of that purpose. That's, that's what a statement of financial purpose is. So, so how do you, like, how do you get at this yeah, yeah. with clients? I mean, I'm assuming this isn't right. Like, 
Jerry came in, okay, kid, you know, what, what, what do you got for my investment portfolio? And say so like, well, Jerry, I like to start by asking you about your statement of financial purpose. Uh, <laughs> you always have much better ways to cue this up than that. But I mean, just like, yeah. how am I getting a conversation there? And particularly since it sounds like, you know, this, this is your aim, even in a pro, this isn't even necessarily like a first client data gathering meeting. This is a prospect conversation, even where it may yeah. come up. So like, how do you get a conversation there? How do you put it out there? Are you literally calling it statement of financial purpose to the clients? Like, how does this yeah. work in a client conversation or in a process? Well, this is super. I love that we're having this conversation because you're asking the questions that all the people that sort of like are, are on um, the same page as you about plan, right? You know what I mean? Like, like, how do I even, how do I even... And yeah, I like just, sounds neat. Sort of get how it might be powerful. Really not cute. sure how to take the conversation there. That's without, cute, Carl. That's without, cute. Without making it awkward, because you know yeah, I'm yeah. nerdy. Like, give me numbers, I can talk about them. I'm not totally. quite sure how to get this conversation there. No, I love I love this because yeah, a lot of us come from a really strong, just sort of like, hey, this is a spreadsheet math problem. Let me get at it. And 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 look, I in the past I've been accused of sort of dismissing dismissing or diminishing the value of that and. I've only recently, by recently, I mean, in the last three years, understood that it's, it's not or, it's and, right? Like the, the, the spreadsheets and the numbers are incredibly important. And if we can get underneath them. So here's how we get at it. Um, this is in, and I think we probably have covered this in other, other um, calls, but it's the first meeting, the client first meeting. I do think it, it was my favorite prospecting tool too, because I would say like, I'm a finance, look, I leaned into I didn't lean into, I'm a life planner. Okay. I, I, I didn't, I, I don't, for me, it didn't work. I know it works for other people to say that, like put it on my card, like all that stuff. I found that to be slightly, um, I don't quite want to use the word off-putting, but it was like people didn't understand it. It was confusing. So I just leaned into like, I'm a wealth manager. I'm a financial advisor. Like I just use that term. Okay. And then it was, I felt like I was playing a series of righteous tricks. And I mean that intentionally, righteous tricks to sort of lead them, like greet them where they are. Like Jerry, I mean, nobody shows up to, nobody ever showed up to my office and said, Carl, could you please help me clarify my financial purpose? Right. Yeah. Like not, not, and, and particularly given what we were just talking about in, in our last episode, this is not the like, my elbow hurts, please help me. Like Carl woke up two o'clock in the morning, could not come up with a statement of financial purpose, couldn't go to sleep until I found one, went on Google, found you with an article about statement of financial purpose, right. and I'm now reaching out to you to become my financial right. advisor for my life savings, right? Like, this said is, no one this ever. Is a, this is a really important conversation because I think if there are people who successfully do the, I'm a life planner, I'm your financial architect, I'm your financial coach, I, like, and they do that successfully, and for them, please keep doing that, that's awesome. But there's a whole group of people, I think like me, that like, that's what I see myself as. But it was just too confusing. In fact, I remember a client early on was like, it, it, we were having this conversation about it. a client early on, he's a doctor. And he said to me, he used Patch Adams as the comparison. He's like, if I, you know, like they're expecting a white coat. Like, why don't I give the, and a stethoscope? Why don't I give them that? Even though I want to do something slightly different, let's greet them with their, ex so we, it doesn't become too stark of a contrast between what they expected. So yeah, so I don't run around saying that. I don't, I don't think I even write much about this. I, it's always a, I'm always thinking, how can I help people lead to that? Like, how can I pull righteous tricks? How can I play chess? Well, so, so here's how it would look. So how do you get them there? Yeah, so here's how it would look. People would come in and I never said like, Here's the intake form, fill out statement of financial purpose and your goals. Goals is the same thing to me. Like, I don't think you're allowed to say it. So we'd sit down and somebody would say, what do you do? Like prospecting wise, what do you do? And I just got so sick of that question. That I would be like, I'm a financial advisor. And then I would wait for that look. And then I would say, but not like that. Like not what you're thinking. Like, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, like, look, I think I can go toe to toe with anybody on an investment, our investment process. Like I've toe to toe no problem defending our investment process. I think we're better than anybody else in the world at it, actually. Um, but, right, none of that matters if we don't know why we're doing it. And then I would always pull out, I love pulling out the old Stephen Covey quote, that it doesn't, like, you don't want to, the last thing you want to do is spend your entire life climbing a ladder only to find out at the end that it's leaning against the wrong wall. 
And so, right, the portfolio is in service of the person and their purpose, not the other way around. So that was like the prospecting way. But let's just quickly fast forward to client comes in for the meeting. So let's just use Jerry and Vera come in for the meeting, right? They got referred, probably got referred because somebody was like, yeah, they know how to invest the money and so much more. And clients didn't even know how to, like, you know, Carl knows my family. You know what I mean? Like they know what's important to us. If I were to pass away, my spouse would feel really comfortable, like all those things, but they wouldn't say, go meet with Carl. He's got a statement of financial purpose, or he'll help you define your goals, or you'll cry on his couch. They would, they would just be like, oh, it's so much different than anything else I've been through because they were comparing it to a broker, right. if you will. Right. Right. So they come in, they're expecting a similar experience. It's why they've got their hands on their wallet. Like, you're not going to get this from me. They're expecting to be pitched portfolio. Yep. And yep. Jerry and Jerry and Vera sit down and it just said, Jerry and Vera, thanks so much for coming today. Like this is literally, there was no small talk. Hey, your kids play rugby. So do mine. Like th- n- none of that stuff. Um, so it was literally Jerry and Vera, thanks for coming today. It's, it's shows how committed you are to making smart decisions about money. So let's get started. And then I would give a little roadmap. Like first meeting, we're going to do this. And if this goes well, we'll have a second meeting. I'd give a little roadmap. But then I would just say, ask the question that helps you uncover the statement of financial purpose. And I, we've been through the question so many times that uh, we're not question zealots. Dan Sullivan's got a great question. Bill Bacharach's got a great question. John Bowen's got a great question. And um, uh, George Kinder's got a whole set of great questions. Who cares which one you use? The point is you're trying to uncover this purpose. So for me, it was, Jerry, why, Little a little twist on Bill Bacharach's question, why is money important to you? And I would say it softly. So it wasn't an interrogation because all the coaches get mad about using why questions. So like, why is money important to you? And, and, and uh, Jerry was like, hmm, gosh, that's a good question. You know what? I, I just don't, I don't want to. And often they would say like something like, oh, I just want a good, I just want <clears throat> performance. And I would say, hey, got it. Performance, super important. I'd write that down. Super important. So instead of saying performance doesn't matter, I'm a life coach. I would say performance, really important because that's true. And we'll get to that. Tell me why is money important? I just go right back to the question, no matter what the question was. And I found the question didn't matter so much as the follow-ups, right? Like the, tell me more, go a little deeper. Jerry literally said almost on the first time, gosh, I, you know, I haven't really ever thought about it this way, but I really don't want to be a burden to the kids. And I wrote that down and was like, don't want to be a burden to the kids. And I was like, is anything else more important? Is there anything more important? He's like, well, I mean, if, if that, then I would also love to leave some money to them during our lives so we could see it. And if that, we get all that done, it would be great if there was still a chunk left over for them when I died. I was like, oh, is there anything more important? No, Jerry, there's no crying. There's no reason to dig deeper. There's no reason to make him go like, you know, whatever. Vera said, essentially like a very similar statement on the same thing. Like, yeah, actually we've talked about this. That's exactly, we just don't want to be a burden to the kids. So then I can say to Jerry and Vera, hey, is there in our work together, would there be anything more important than helping you? Like, is it okay if I view all of our work together through that set of lenses. Oh, that'd be great. Okay, now now you can see how cool that is because now we can say, okay, let's talk a little bit about this. Would it be okay if we put some framework around never being a burden to the kids? And when we do, Jerry and Vera, is it okay if we call that a goal? It's so much better than what's your goal. Right. So, and then we can say, okay, cool, that. How much would you like to leave to the, how much would you like to, oh, could we do $10,000 a year? That'd be amazing. Okay, right. Now we put a bunch of framework around the goals. Now they know their goals sit on top of this thing we've now defined as purpose. And then at the end of that meeting, it's not, it never came out of my mouth, statement of financial purpose until the end. Like maybe even at the end of that, before we move to goals, you could say, okay, I've written down, I've written this down. You said, let me make sure I got this right. You said you never want to be a burden to the kids. You'd love to leave some to that. You'd love to see them enjoy some of the inheritance while you're alive. And if there was some left over, that would be great. Did I get that right? Yeah. 
what if, is if it's okay, I have a name for this. We just call it a statement of financial purpose. Is that all right? Yeah, that's great. That's how it happened. And so then financial plan, future meetings, just this sits at the top of the one page plan or, or whatever document you're putting back in front of them just to be like that visible filter, that visible, hey, in case we forgot, like this is, this is what we were building on. Everything follows from, from, from this. I'm, I'm going to guess that means from time to time, like you would sit down with the client on this. They would actually say like, actually, I'm not sure that's the thing anymore. Right. Like you said, I mean, your ER doc was, was like for, uh, flexibility, freedom, and time to think about having a family that goes well at some point she has a family and yep. that may yep. not be the statement of financial purpose anymore. Cause her, her lives moved and she's a, she's at a different place. So like yep. you put it up there every now and then a client will say, Hey, I, actually, I feel like it's a little bit different now and that's fine. That's just a door you open and go down that, go down that pathway if they open the door. Yeah. So a couple of things there, I think we, we do it almost more intentionally. And, and so a couple of things, right? Like if it's on the top of the document, you know how some books have a, have a call out quote at the beginning of the chapter. Yep. And it's almost always italicized, you know, like stands out a little bit, like yep. it can just be on the document and you don't necessarily even have to point at it every single time right like okay. so that's that's one thing to keep in mind like it's just there it's just a reminder to me it's the touchstone but let's get back to like uh, you know the well i want to cover the changing part but let's first let's talk about like it's the thing just keep in mind i think we're asking people to say like a large part of the job of a successful financial planner over decades is to get people to say no and yes, for the right, at the right time and the right reason. And often it's saying no a lot. Like you're, you're asking people to say no to an emotion that they want to get out of the market. You're asking people to say no to spending. You're asking people to say no to a lot of things. My, and I, look, I, this all started out of the goal to close the behavior gap, right? Like that's right. I, for 25 years, I've been trying to figure out how to close that. Yep. And the only thing I could find was to give them a bigger yes. Like in order to say no to all those things, I had to give them a bigger, yes, I tried facts and figures. Don't you know the average bear market? Don't you know if you missed the 10 best days? Don't you know? Like that doesn't work. I tried a goals, goal-based planning. Oh, we all do goal-based planning. Da, 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 da. That didn't always work. I mean, it worked better than the other things we used to do. And then I, after that, I tried like a plan and that worked better than facts and figures and goals. And it worked better than, but it still, and so I was like, what's a succinct way to bring them back to what they said when they were thinking clearly, when they're in the middle of wanting to make a slightly, I'm gonna just call it a slightly irrational, but it's at least slightly off plan decision. So if they call wanting to make one of those decisions, I like to think of it as just a scary market, right? Like scary market conversation. We can use this, hey, Michael, before we dive into that, I understand you're scared, nervous. To be honest, when I watch the news, I get scared and nervous too right now. But before we dive into why and, and what we want to do about it, can I grab your file, right? When, what do you grab? You grab the one page plan and you say, hey, let me just double check on something. When we first met, you told me time with your family, mainly outside, service in your community. Is that still true? Yeah. Okay, cool. So we're just, we're taking them from way out here back to the foundation. What's sitting there? Purpose. So that's, that's how it's used. It should be, you. it's a living, breathing document. It's not, it's not meant to be filed. And then this last thing on changing. Of course it changes. And I think we need to get better at like actively, I, I think of it as like actively looking for disconfirming evidence. Like we, sometimes we think if we change something for some reason we're wrong, like right. we were wrong, like we've made a mistake. And I think we need to flip that. Like it, there's a term in um, complexity theory, there's a term called error, error, error embracing. Error embracing. Like when the error shows up, we, so, in the statement of financial purpose, we should expect it to change. But having said that, on an interview yesterday, somebody asked me when I changed mine last. 15 years, right? Like I, it hasn't changed. And, it, and I was trying to anticipate when it would change. Time with my family, mainly outside, serving my community and church. I, I don't see that changing. So, so then one follow-on question just that I've, I've got, 
uh, you know, maybe this is just me channeling too many times doing like business meetings with mission and vision statements, which I'm, I'm sort uh, of channeling in a similar theme, right? Where yeah. we spend so much time sometimes trying to find like the word, the image, like there's often a lot of polishing that goes into mission vision statements. Should I, should I be thinking about statement of financial purpose the same way? Am I, am I overthinking it? Do I just grab whatever words is the client said close enough? I'm going to put it on a page. Cause if they don't like those words, they'll tell me next meeting when I put it on a, on a page, like how, how much do I have to worry or care about trying to craft this or polish this? Cause yeah, like your, it. your sounds really polished and catchy. I'm like, I don't think mine's going to be the first time. I don't think a lot of clients are going to be there. So is, uh, like yeah. how, how, how polished does this need to be, or should I expect it to be, or do I, do I work towards? Such a great question. And I look I, a couple of things. I'm not a zealot about any of this stuff. So like whether you call it ever, like we had one of my favorite financial planners was on a, a on a call last month where we were talking about this. And she said, it's just too cheesy for me to call it a statement of financial purpose. I'm like, then don't call it that. Right. Like the point is we're trying to capture the client's words. Mm -hmm. How do they describe if you were just to uh, Ron Lieber, the editor of the New York Times, once when we were having lunch, pinned me down in a, like in a corner in a restaurant and asked me like seven deep whys why that he did the seven whys game to me. And I remember being at the end, like, I don't know, but this, right. And that was like the thing yeah. that we were trying to, so it's sort of like, if you could just get a client. So first of all, don't be too worried about calling it anything. Cause as soon as you bring up mission statement, I'm just like, dude, I'm out, <laughs> you know? And, and yeah, I could, I could see how close this could be like, Oh, you mean people have said that. Oh, you mean like a client's mis financial mission statement? I'm like, yeah, yeah. So we don't have to call it anything, but, and then to answer your question, Jerry's isn't polished. I don't want to be burned to the kids. Amazing, right? Like I, I was always like, well, that's not really, nobody cried that. And then I was like, well, Jerry had never said that to anyone else ever. And now it's, now it's like a thing. So yeah. I think the most important part, the rawness of it, the lack of polish, is a benefit because it's the most important part is that it's their words, right? And it resonates mm -hmm. with them. And back to your early question about changing, I would actively ask that. I, like, I think it's at least an annual conversation where you just say, hey, you know, you'd mentioned this to me last year. Is, is, is this changed at all? Still feel like it, it, it captures. And Julie, ER doctor would say, you know, yeah, the family thing, we've, we've, it's been five or six years now. The, kids are getting a little older. I've had time to have a family. Now I'm more focused on da, da, da. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you for, for sharing, Carl. I, you know, just, we've, you've mentioned a lot of times we've kind of gone a little bit down the road, but hadn't really got into like, how do you do this? How do you get this out of a client? So appreciate the discussion. Super fun. Thanks for asking the questions. Awesome. Thank you, Carl.